Hello, my name is Sam Feltham. I'm the Director of the Public Health Collaboration and welcome to the PHC Virtual Conference 2020. The coronavirus has changed all of our lives, but where there's an obstacle, there's also an opportunity. And that opportunity comes in the guise of this virtual conference. Earlier this year, we had to postpone our two main events, the annual conference and the Real Food Rocks Festival until next year. These events allow us to connect, learn and grow, but they also help us raise crucial funds for the PHC to continue. With that in mind, and before we let the next presenter speak, this virtual conference is 100% free for all. But if you find the content valuable today, then please consider donating £2 or whatever you can afford through the Total Giving website via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate. Or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world, and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation on the comments section here on YouTube or via the hashtag PHCVCon2020 on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for your support, take care and stay safe. Thank you so much for having me on Public Health Collaboration. My name is Bitten Johnson. I'm a registered nurse and I'm also a recovering alcoholic for 34 years plus and recovering sugar and food addict for 26 years plus. So I'm very grateful to be able to share this with you uh, because addiction medicine is uh, my uh, favorite thing to work with to uh, help clients and to teach professionals, which is mostly what I do today. And during this uh, paper, I will tell you about screening, evaluation, assessment, and diagnostic of sugar food addiction, which I think is very important. Uh, there are so many clients out there that suffer today, and most healthcare professionals and other uh, nutritional experts, uh, you know, personal trainers, people in the health feed all over have no idea how to know if it is a sugar addict or somebody with only harmful use. And this is what I hopefully gonna to talk to you about today. Uh, so uh, I have worked with sugar food addiction for 27 years and developed a treatment model that is um, uh, holistic to its nature. You know, that means I work with traditional medicine, uh, integrated uh, integrated medicine, orthomolecular medicine, self help groups, and well, any tool that works actually. Since 2012, uh, I'm training and coaching professionals. Uh, I was very lonely as a counselor in Sweden for so many years, and the caseload was way too big. So that's how I started to work with teaching. I'm also a faculty member of the INFACT, which is another uh, uh, addiction, food addiction counselor training. And I do certify and license professionals uh, in sugar, which I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. I'm also uh, on the board of directors for Food Addiction Institute, and I call myself a starfish thrower. I'll explain what that is all about. I've written five books and I'm a contributor on the Diet Doctor page. Um, I am not funded from anywhere. Um, the money I get is from teaching and training, and um, I have some non-financial relationships, which you can read about. This, uh, this picture, or statue, or whatever you're gonna call it, uh, is really explaining addiction to me. What is addiction? Well, short, you could say that addiction is being trapped in a vicious circle of losing control over the drug, the behavior you have, being totally obsessed with why did I do it? Uh, how am I going to fix this? Trying to control, regaining some control, losing control, being obsessed, and so on. So, actually, you know, if you look at the figure to your left, you're totally disconnected from a normal life. So uh, hopefully with knowledge, which is power, uh, I uh, have helped thousands of clients and teach professional today 
how you can help somebody to break free from it. And, you know, the figure to the right, that's being happy, joyous, and free, and totally connected to life. You're not ruled by your addiction anymore. So uh, the freedom sculpture means a lot to me, and it's very uh, uh, symbolic for what's going on with addiction. I have met through the years many telling me that, well, you know, uh, food addiction or sugar addiction must be a, it's not a real addiction. It sort of looks like addiction, but you know, it's more like a milder addiction or it's not that bad. And uh, I'm going to tell you one thing. It is the number one worst addiction. Why is that? Well, it's extremely tough to treat. Very few people understand how to treat it. First of all, how to assess for it, how to screen for it. Uh, how to see what's going on, uh, and then uh, to know a um, treatment plan because, you know, it's a chronic illness. Once the addiction has taken part in your reward center in your brain, you know, you, uh, you can't be cured. You can be treated. We can uh, arrest it, but we can't cure it. So it's very tough to treat. And of all the drugs in the world, you know, it is the earliest exposure. So uh, you get the drug when you're a kid, when your brain is not ready-made, uh, you know, it's not totally wired yet. So therefore it hampers the wiring. And that's also why you get something called, we call the biochemical denial. It is a, a type of denial where you don't see how things are connected and what's really the problem due to the uh, toxic effect the drug has on our brain you know especially on the prefrontal cortex but also neocortex so you know the uh, this is a disease that's in the reward center and it strengthens the reptilian survival part of our brain uh, you know but uh, that means that we have less activity and less learning and wiring in limbic system um, and neocortex and prefrontal cortex. This drug is available everywhere, you know. Alcohol and cocaine is not available everywhere and you don't get it as a kid. It's very poorly understood by National Board of Health and Welfare and the national health systems all over the world, you know, it's because it's not regarded as an addiction, really. And very few people have deep training in addiction medicine and really understand, you know, what it means to have loss of control and being obsessed with thoughts of the food, how to diet, my weight, the food again, not eat, to eat, and so on. And then, of course, you have a food industry that is, you know, really pushing this. And a lot of other people, too. Uh, you know, uh, most people think that you can learn to have a little bit, you know, why don't you just have a little bit on Saturday or, you know, a little bit uh, now and then. And the problem is that as a sugar food addict, it's impossible. One bite is too much and thousand will never be enough. So that's why this is such a difficult illness. And also what I see that the world is doing is treating the consequences of the sugar addiction, not the addiction per se. So, you know, with sugar addiction, you have physical, psychological, social, and spiritual consequences. And I know you're familiar with many of these. I just mentioned a few. Uh, volatile blood sugar, weight problems, inflammations, diabetes type 2, uh, aches and pains, uh, fatigue. You know, sugar is a very false energy. So if you take in two units of energy, uh, you lose four units of your own energy. So most people are very depleted of energy, which makes it really hard to start a recovery process unless you understand how to uh, do what we call biochemical repair to restore the energy so that somebody can start a recovery process. Mood swings, false feelings, you know. Uh, they don't work very well to do therapy on, I promise you. Depression worry, anxiety, feeling disconnected. Socially, uh, there's a lot of shame and stigma around this. So a lot of the uh, people eat in hiding. You don't 
you can eat very normal when you're with other people, but it's when you're alone that you really indulge in your addiction, which makes you feel shameful and a bad person and think you have a low character and that old stuff, which is not the case, you know. So uh, you get work-related problems, you know, you're really energetic one day and really low and poor performance another day. The feeling of being different, uh, you know, you isolate and so forth. Spiritually, you can feel a loss of meaning, no contact with nature or other people or life in general. And you lose faith in life. And this fatigue that really, really hampers you to have a normal day and a normal life. So many times, you know, people go into therapy or uh, seek help for the physical problems and all that. But nobody understands how to screen, assess, and do a deep evaluation of an underlying problem. So that's what I want to get you into this wor that world today. I work by ASEM's latest definition. Uh, the, uh, I've done for all the years. I met ASEM in my own uh, treatment, 1985. So I started looking at them there. Uh, you can look up ASEM.org if you want to read more. But anyway. 2011 in November, they said that addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain, reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. So you can read more about this here, you know, the dysfunction and so forth. And like any other chronic disease, addiction often involves cycles of relapse and remiss remission. In 2019, they added one word to this definition. They said it's a medical illness. And that's what I say. It's a physical illness in the brain that creates physical, psychological, social, and spiritual consequences. And I also think that it's wonderful that the Doctors uh, Association in the U.S. talks about spiritual, con spiritual con consequences and that they mean that that is loss of meaning. This is the original latest definition, and you can see down here I circled food. So if you want to read all that, you have it there. Uh, through all the years, I think the thing that really uh, upsets me most is that uh, people think that everybody else is like me. If I can control it, if I don't get craving from eating a little bit of chocolate or whatever it is, you shouldn't either. But we are biochemically unique, you know. And I think the most important thing for uh, professionals that work with people is to understand the three groups that we talk about, the social user. I mean, they never get obsessed. They don't get craving. They take one bite of something, chocolate, ice cream, bread, whatever, and then they're satisfied. They do not become obsessed. They do not lose control. They do not get negative consequences. So we don't have to work with those, okay? Then we have the harmful users. They are the people that eat by culture uh, because they don't know any better, they ha don't have any knowledge, because they are stressed, because they are uh, unhappy, uh, a loved one left them, you know, emotions, stressors, uh, all kinds of uh, reasons they could eat. Uh, so a harmful user, if you look at them, they might look like an addict in the beginning, but if you understand addiction medicine, if you know how to ask the right questions, you're going to find out that harmful use, use is very different from addiction. And then the third group is the addicts, which is called the pathological use in ICD-10, or WHO's a diagnostic manual and substance use disorder in DSM-5, which is made by American Psychiatric Association. So that's what we talk about, the obsession and the loss of control, the really, really tough illness to treat. And I like this too, because, you know, so many times uh, my clients and I, we, we know that people are going to ask us, but why do you binge eat this? Why do you try to starve yourself? Why do you eat like this? Why can't you stop? Why don't you do what I tell you? <laughs> the doctor and nurses think. Well, asking why is totally okay when you work with harmful users and prevention. That's when you're going to use the why do you do this. But with addiction, that's an acquired and primary illness. So ask how to help instead. 
uh, asking why there is like, you know, saying to somebody that is really allergic to a cat and you tell them, please, please hold the cat close to your nose. And then they sneeze and you say, why did you sneeze? You know, so don't ask why with addicts. Ask, how can I help you, please? This is the progress of addiction. Uh, most clients come and seek help when they are around 40 years old because that's when they have, you know, JoJo dieted and fought this illness for years with every method you can imagine, you know, Weight Watchers 10 times, every diet you can think of, pills, powders, gym cards, exercise. I mean, they have tried everything. Uh, buying a new car, that's what we call geographic escape, you know, maybe I won't eat in my new car, um, divorcing, getting a new husband or wife or getting another dog or, I mean, people have tried the most incredible things when you interview them. You'd be shocked if you knew all of these things. But usually it starts with a four or five year old that really, really likes sweets and we joke and say, you know, it's a sweet rat and a sweet tooth and all that. Uh, but you can see that this child really wants what many parents call the white stuff, you know, like bread, pasta, um, ice cream, sweets, and so forth. And then in the teens, they start to diet, you know. Very early in the teen, people start dieting. Uh, and some people end up being restrictors, you know, all the way to really starving themselves. And then one day they might not have the energy to start themselves or somebody tell them to start eating in moderation and they start eating sweets again and everything. And then they start binge eating and purging and purging can be throwing up. It could be, you know, uh, 10 hours of exercise during the day, laxatives. There are so many ways that people purge until, you know, when you don't have the energy and strength to keep binging and purging and you become a volume eater, an overeater, and you eat huge amounts of food and you put on weight. Most people put on weight, not everybody do that. You can have visceral fat and you could have a very bad metabolic picture, uh, but you might not be fat on the outside. Most people end up being overweight by time though and get all of those consequences that I mentioned. So sugar addiction takes many shapes. Uh, I've had uh, all these three uh, through all the years. So uh, you cannot know by looking at somebody if they have a sugar addiction or not. That's impossible. You need to know much more about this person in order to understand what's going on. So why is it so important to diagnose, to do uh, assessment evaluations? Well, it's unethical to treat someone without knowing what is to be treated. If you have a diabetes client that has a sugar addiction underlying, they, they no matter which good method, low carb keto you help them to do, they will not be able to stick to it. The compliance will not be there because they have an underlying problem that is much stronger than the advice you're getting them. So sooner or later, they are you know, uh, prone to relapsing. That's how this uh, illness works. So, and also it's risk for incorrect treatment in regards to abuse, harmful use and dependency addiction. Uh, most people think that you can work with moderation therapy on addicts. You can't. Have you ever heard anyone telling a heroin addict to have a little bit of heroin on Saturday? It's the same for a sugar addict. We have to take away all the sugar, sweeteners, flours, processed foods, and trigger foods. For some people, for some sugar addicts, you know, uh, Milk products like heavy cream, cheese, sour cream could be trigger foods. Nuts, trigger foods. There are many trigger foods that we wouldn't put in the group of processed foods, but they are trigger foods to some addicts. So we have to learn and know that. So uh, moderation therapy will work with harmful users, but not with addicts. So we need to know what is what. And also, it's very essential for an individual's understanding of his or her condition, motivation, and formulation of realistic goals, you know. It takes time to rewire the brain, to heal the brain, 
to do biochemical repair, to get a metabolically dysfunctional body to start working again if you are a sensitive sugar food addict. And uh, if we know that, you know, we make the treatment plan according to that. And one of the things we really work on is to motivate the person to keep doing it one day at a time. And this is going to take time and we are supportive. So we need to choose adequate treatment programs and aftercare, uh, you know, according to severity. For some people, the addiction hasn't taken hold too hard. For some people, they have a tremendous amount of consequences and a very severe picture. And we need to make the treatment plan according to that. And of course, it's very essential when we do research for treatment results, you know. It's useless to do research if one doesn't know what condition has been treated. So that's why a lot of the food research is so crazy and so giving such a wrong picture because nobody tells, uh, was that a harmful user or was it a food addict? Uh, if you're interested to learn more about sugar and why it is so important to be certified, licensed, and trained in doing the sugar evaluation, I recommend you to send me an email and I'm going to send you back Avoid the Pearls of Instrument Abuse by Norm Hoffman, the founder of the SADS instrument, which uh, Addis is built upon, and then sugar is built upon Addis. You can read more on my website about this. Uh, something that we could do, you know, uh, at the doctor's office, um, at the gym, at anywhere where we want to help somebody to understand what's going on, anyone that struggles, we could start with a simple screening. This is a screening uh, where we ask for, uh, we, we call, you know, we, we uh, tell the client that when we talk about sweets, citation marks, we mean any carb carbohydrate, such as pasta, bread, desserts, cookies, soda, ice cream, pizza, cereal, potatoes, rice, sweeteners, and so forth. And you can read uh, what UNCOPE stands for, but you know, it's a very simple screening. It is six questions and you answer yes or no to those. And if you have two or more yes here's, it indicates a problem but we still don't know if it is harmful use or addiction. So the recommendation is that you do sugar if you have two or more. And I can tell you that the people that we do sugar on that do have an addiction, they always have four or more yes, sometimes three, but usually we see four, five or six yes. And then when we do the sugar, we see that they do have an addiction. So this is a simple way Stick this in the hand of your client at your uh, doctor's office or in the healthcare ward or whatever you work with clients, you know, and see, could it be an underlying problem? Because if you deal with that as it isn't there, you know, it's going to be like scratching on ice with this client. You're not going to get anywhere in the long run. So if you read uh, about SADS on evinsassessment.com, made by Norm Hoffman, you're going to find out about ADIS, uh, which you can read about on my website, and which is a diagnostic tool used for um, seeing the difference between harmful use and addiction on alcohol, uh, subscription pills, and drugs. And then sugar. Uh, 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 you know what that stands for today. So these are evaluation models that increases motivation and compliance and provides us with information to do a precise treatment planning. That's why it is so important. The sugar instrument is a net version today and we have it in English and Swedish and actually it's gonna be in Danish soon and we are also translating it into Spanish. So yeah, we hope to have that soon on there too. It's a total of 67 questions. And I uh, took one example of a question here. Uh, of course, we have gone through with the client what the word sweet food stands for. And then we ask this question, for instance, has the desire craving for sweet food ever been so strong that you could not resist? And you see there is a no, there is a yes. And then we ask, has it happened last year? and last month. 
and at what time in your life did you feel this for the first time? So that's how we get the age span, you know, the age of onset. And for this client, it was at five years of age, and she's still doing that. So this is the result. Once you have, you know, answered all the 67 questions, um, you can look this up immediately after finishing the last question. And this is a checklist, you know, of pathological use. We, uh, today it is in ICD-10, but within a month or so, we will be able to do it in both ICD-10 and DSM-5. So it, it is pathological use if assessment shows at least three actual symptoms spread in at least three criteria. And as you see in ICD-10, there are six criteria here. And there is, of course, several questions on each criteria. So every A means actual, last 12 months. L means lifetime, more than 12 months ago. And M, past month. So anyway, if we look at the results down here, this client has 17 actual symptoms spread in all six criteria. So uh, there is no doubt that this is a sugar addict, no way. And also we look at, are there symptoms in criteria three and four? And yes, it is. And that's why, you know, you can see uh, it says with physical signs. So the diagnose here will be pathological use with 17 symptoms in six criteria with the physical signs. So actually, uh, it's only doctors that do diagnosis, but we can say that this is a diagnostic assessment that we can provide, provide uh, somebody uh, with a doctor or uh, whomever. Uh, and also, when uh, we have done the interview, uh, we will get something called the symptom curve, which is you know mapping the client's whole life in chronological order. So this is a female, and she is 55 years old, and you can see she's been struggling her whole life. Every black dot here is one symptom, you know, uh, on the checklist. So this client has actually 24, we have symptoms here, 24 symptoms, that's maximum what you can have in all six criteria. And uh, she's never received any treatment. And you can see that she started restricting when she was 12 years old, you know, I, I, it, which means dieting, binging, dieting, binging. She also tried for a period here slimming pills and amphetamine. Actually, I've had several clients becoming criminal drug addicts in order to stop cravings when they buy amphetamine you know, on the black market. Uh, of course, restricting doesn't work, obsessing doesn't work, so she starts binging and volume eating, you know, and gaining weight and losing weight. She also tried uh, nicotine. She started smoking when she was 16, and in order to curb her appetite because she heard, heard from people around her that that was a good idea. So she smoked until she was 41. And also uh, at uh, the age of uh, 19, she reached her adult height. So, uh, no, I'm sorry, 18. Uh, she reached her adult height. And that's when we start doing the weight curve. We do not do weight curves on children and teenagers. So the blue lines is her weight curve. And you can also see that she was over consuming alcohol from the age of 16 and until up here. So uh, if you look at the uh, weight curve, you see that she has been fluctuating tremendously through the years. And actually, when I was talking to her, she told me that she was doing 70 pounds up and down many times through the years. Uh, and uh, at here, at 53 years of age, she reached her maximum weight, and she has been struggling really, really hard. So to showing this curve to her and work with it interactively is something that really uh, creates a deep, deep understanding, acceptance of the illness, and see the struggle you've had, and also it helps me doing this interview to really uh, make a correct uh, treatment plan for her. 
Uh, and here, uh, this is another one, it's not the same client, but you can see the assessment and recommendations. This is the result after we have done the curves, we have done, you know, the checklist and all that. We write a, a reason for the interview. And we also uh, see on this uncope, she had six out of six on the uncope, alcohol, nothing. Previous treatments, we have seen that. And also the assessment. And this client meets the requirement for pathological use with 70 actual symptoms spread in six criteria. So this is the same as the checklist. And here is the recommendations uh, done by the uh, certified professional that has been doing this one. Okay. So the sugar evaluation assessment is a therapeutic interview. That's very important to see. It's giving the client a deep, deep insight and in a very um, understanding way from the professionals. Its objective is not depending on who does the assessment at all. It's a very structured interview. It provides quality assurance for both you and your client. And it aids the clients in gaining insight, which in return affects motivation and compliance, of course, you know. It provides information essential for precise treatment, planning for instance, current versus remission. If, you know, uh, this client uh, has had symptoms more than 12 months ago, every symptom would be L lifetime more than 12 months ago, we would say that it's a pathological use in remission. We can also see if this client is in early versus late stage of the three addiction uh, stages. Most of all, it takes away stigma and shame and it shows that this is an illness. The therapeutic session with the sugar curve, which we do interactive, you know, helps the client see reality and at the same time educating and giving hope. So what it actually is, is a stage intense and dramatic crisis with very strong feelings, which is exactly what is needed for most clients to accept help and a strong foundation for treatment planning. Most clients, when I show them this, the results, they say, well, you know what? I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was this bad. And I'm relieved. I no, I'm not nuts. I'm not a crazy person. I have an illness. And now I can see what I've been fighting all these years and understand that I need a totally different uh, way of, of going about this. <clears throat> so uh, I'd like to end this by telling you the starfish story. When you go out and look at all the clients out there and the, how the world look with you know, all these people that are sick in this illness today. I've heard experts in, in US say that maybe 70% uh, in the US is sugar addiction today. I'm not sure about England, but I'm sure it is a huge number here in Sweden, 40% maybe, uh, I don't know. England may be the same. Uh, I used to think about this starfish story because it's easy to be very, very overwhelmed and think that, oh my God, how am I going to help all these people? What am I going to do? How can I be enough for this? So uh, I found this several years ago. So I jokingly call myself today a certified starfish thrower. You know, this young lady is walking on the beach and there are thousands of uh, starfish blown up from a storm and she's throwing them back into the ocean one by one. And then uh, this man comes up and he say to her, you know, uh, you can't save all these, you know, so it doesn't make a difference what you're doing. And then she picks up one more, she throws it back in the water and she said, well, you know, it's going to make a difference for this one. So that's what I do. Uh, I uh, work with throwing a starfish at a time back into the ocean to help people help themselves. If you have any questions, you know, about this or any material I can pro provide you with or more in-depth knowledge, please let me know. You can reach me through my website. And thank you very much for letting me share this today. Okay, see you.